Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of John Quincy Adams, and the focus is politician. The year is 1801. Adams has just returned after five years abroad, where he was in the service of his country as a minister to foreign late nations. And he has come home and the political landscape has changed. His father is no longer president. Thomas Jefferson is now uh, in the executive mansion and the Democratic Republicans have taken over both houses of Congress. So no appointments are gonna be coming his way and he's gotta figure out what to do next. Well, he considers running for office himself, but he is weary of this career path for one main reason, the influence of political parties, the factions that are already driving behavior in politics that, that he loathes that concept. He said at the time, I feel strong temptation and have great provocation to plunge into political controversy, but I hope to preserve myself from it. A politician in this country must be the man of a party. I would fain be the man of my whole country. This is where Adams and the creed of the family of independence do right. The big picture of the country and society, that's what motivated him, not the dictates of a political party that was simply pursuing power for its own end. But this was the system that was gradually you know, getting involved in the United States, and he needed to figure out how to maneuver within it. Well, he does run for office. He wins a seat in the Massachusetts State Senate. He really only accomplished one thing. He wasn't there very long. His hometown of Braintree, well, he, he helped get the northern section of that town to be separated into a new town that they called Quincy. So he's no longer from Braintree, now from Quincy, Massachusetts. He decided to run for Congress, but did not win. William Eustis beat him by about one and a half percentage points. It was close, but he didn't win. He figured, okay, well, maybe politics isn't going to happen, at least not right now. I don't want to do it but I'll go be a lawyer, have a career. He never wanted to really get into the law, but he held, put out his shingle. He established his shop in, in Boston, where he spent most of the week. He would go home on weekends. And part of this, now, John Quincy Adams was an exercise enthusiast, especially long, brisk walks. That was his main form of exercise. And so he often would walk from Quincy to Boston, about nine and a half miles each way. It, might have been the highlight of his day, given the drudgery associated with the law. Well, fortunately for John Quincy Adams, it didn't last that long because the state legislature of Massachusetts did give him a political position. They asked him to become a United States senator in 1803, and John Quincy Adams accepted. The person most unhappy about this was his wife, Louisa. Again, sort of the ongoing saga as she sort of has disdain for many of his assignments. And this time it was she didn't want to go to Washington, which was basically a swamp, a tiny town that was starting to grow on the banks of the Potomac River. She said when they got there, the city not being laid out, the streets not graduated, the bridges consisting of mere loose planks and huge stumps of trees recently cut down, intercepting every path and the roads intersected by deep ravines continually enlarged by rain. This just was not a happy lady going to her new hometown, but she did, and she brought her not one, just one, but two children along. To go with George, their first son, they now have another John Adams in the family. She's gonna watch the kids while they settle into Georgetown, right next door to Washington, and a slightly better place to raise a family, but still, she's not very happy about it. Now, John Quincy Adams had been placed into office by the Federalists, who still were in a dominant position in New England, even though they had lost their sort of power on the national scene. But, but Adams was not going to simply align to the party. It just wasn't in him. He had too much of an independent streak to think broader than party interests. And this manifested itself a couple of times during his, Senate, his days in the U.S. Senate. Thomas Jefferson, the president, his greatest accomplishment arguably was the Louisiana Purchase from France, 15 million bucks, 800,000 square miles, doubles the size of the country. There were constitutional concerns about this. In fact, Jefferson shared some of those concerns and talked about it potentially even having to ask for an amendment to the Constitution, but decided to put that aside. But the Federalists in New England were opposed to the acquisition, in particular the constitutional issues, but John Quincy Adams did not share those, and he wasn't going to simply bow to the whim of the party. He was happy to support this transaction. He said, I have had 
already occasion to experience what I had before reason to expect, the danger of adhering to my own principles. The country is so totally given up to the spirit of party that not to follow the one or the other is an unexpiable offense. But my choice is made. If I cannot hope to give satisfaction to my country, I am at least determined to have the approbation of my own reflection. This was not a shift to the other party because he favored the Louisiana Purchase. It was just a demonstration of his independent thinking, which would be a hallmark of his entire career, just like his father's. Well, Adams also picked up a part-time gig. It was a perfect fit for him. Professor of Rhetoric and Oratory at Harvard. He'd, he'd always sort of had this affinity for Harvard, having graduated for there as part of a lifelong commitment to the university. And no one loved debate more than John Quincy Adams. So to have this professorship was a perfect fit. But even in this case, he had two conditions. He wanted to change the schedule. Normally, professors would give lectures one a week for 40 weeks. Well, he didn't want to be traveling. He had to have his commitment in the U.S. Senate, so he said, let's do this. 20 weeks, two lectures a week, and we'll do it when the Senate is out of session. Harvard said fine. But then he also asked for a waiver to not have to take the religious oath that was required by the Harvard faculty. It wasn't that his religious beliefs were incompatible with the school. It's just the oath itself was incompatible with his own personal creed. He didn't want to take the oath. So Harvard said, okay, and it worked out really well. He loved the role, worked really hard at it, prepared thoroughly, used a lot of historical examples in his, in his uh, lectures, personal examples. In fact, there were a lot of guests beyond the students who came to hear these lectures. It was enjoyable to him and he did quite well at it. Family life still was a struggle. 1807, Louisa had a stillborn baby, but then the following year, a third boy came onto the scene, Charles Francis Adams, born in 1808. But Louisa is still unhappy with her husband. Unlike John Quincy Adams' parents, John Adams and Abigail, they talk shop all the time. John Adams was very open with his wife uh, about his political interests. John Quincy Adams was not of that ilk. He didn't talk to his wife about his business, but his business was most of his life. And so it was a cold, impersonal relationship that was simply persisting. Remember that independent streak of John Quincy Adams? It was also persisting. 1808, difficult times for the country. President Jefferson, Secretary of State James Madison, they're trying to keep the United States out of war with Britain and or France. They're at war with each other. Both are attacking American shipping, trade that was bound for their, their enemy. And Jefferson and Madison don't want to go to war with either one, but they had to do something because they couldn't let their ships just be attacked with impunity. So what do they do? They tried an economic model. They imposed an embargo. They thought this would bring Britain or France to heal and, and stop these depredations. Well, first of all, it didn't work at all. Britain and France found plenty of other both markets for its goods as well as suppliers for its raw, raw materials. So they weren't harmed by this, but the ones who were harmed was the American economy particularly New England. 75% of their trade fell off the map. Shipbuilding and shipping were the major or were among the major sources of economic activity in the northeastern part of the country, the home of John Quincy Adams and his constituents. Nevertheless, he supported the embargo. He thought it was a reasonable policy to preserve the peace, avoid war, and try to get an outcome that would be favorable. So he was one of the very few, like the only senator, in fact, from the Northeast that actually voted to support Jefferson and Madison's embargo. And boy, did he hear about it from his constituents, from the politicians in New England, from the press. He was sort of ripped from all different angles. And his father weighed in and said, look, you are supported by no party. You have too honest a heart, too independent a mind, and too brilliant talents to be sincerely and confidentially trusted by any man who is under the dominion of party maxims or party feelings. And where is there another man who is not? You may depend on him that your fate is decided. This is the Adams Creed. It's not going to be easy, but father and son completely aligned in this independent way of thinking. But that was not the thinking of the politicians in Massachusetts. They were not happy with Adams. And in fact, they voted his replacement a year before it was time to go. Well, Adams took this as a complete affront. It was not only a vote of no confidence, he thought it was an attack on his character, so he resigned on the spot. And he left office. John Quincy Adams was never out of work for very long. In this case, Europe would be calling again very soon. 
But that's the story for another day. That is John Quincy Adams and Politician from the life of John Quincy Adams. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.